I'm Tammy Haddad, and this is Washington Insider. Thank you for joining us. We're going international with our next guest, Chris Addison, a British actor, comedian, writer, and director. Teenagers in America know him for his role on Skins. Adults know him for his role on The Thick of It. Chris is a director and one of the executive producers of Veep. And I'd like to say up front, I do work for HBO and am a consultant on this show. For those of you who may not be familiar with Veep, it's an Emmy award-winning comedy set in the office of a fictional vice president, now president, played by Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Tammy. Let's talk about the short film you helped create for the 2014 White House Correspondents' Dinner. Now, HBO sure, asked me to call over to the White House and see if they'd be game to do some kind of video. So I called the White House and talked to Shayla Murray in the Vice President's Office, the Deputy Chief of Staff. Hello? Selena, what are you doing? And told her that HBO wanted to do something and she was all game for it and came up with this great idea to do a kind of Ferris Bueller's Day Off so we'd have Julia Lee Drive as the star of Veep as Vice President and Vice President Joe Biden as himself. Now, Chris, that's where you came in. Yeah, well, that's where the whole of, uh, of Team Veep came in, really. Uh, once you guys had, had set all that up, which amazed us, uh, then we set about trying to create a script that would, uh, that would feature Joe Biden and feature Julia as Selena uh, goofing off together, which is kind of a tricky thing to do because you're combining uh, two worlds that shouldn't really combine. And you've got uh, politicians are all, as we know, good actors to one extent or another, but, uh, but it's a whole different thing to start doing a comedy sketch uh, if, you're a, uh, if you're a politician rather than a comedian or an actor. So we had to start with, uh, you know, a, a really simple idea, which is what we uh, what we had, and uh, and just pursue it in as many directions as, as we possibly could and make it so that it felt like it was part of uh, Selena's world a bit, or at least Julia's world, uh, and also uh, it was part of um, uh, Joe Biden's world. And it's quite a strange thing to try and marry those those two uh, different worlds because on the one hand you know our impulse with Veep of course is to mock and be satirical and the impulse of the politicians is to try and mock themselves to a lesser extent to try and minimize that as as far as possible and of course they're always all politicians when you get them on board to do something like this they're super excited to do it but they are also nervous because they're kind of outside their comfort zone uh, which is no human likes to be outside their comfort zone, but politicians least of all like to be outside their comfort zone. So huge props to Joe Biden for, uh, for being such a good sport and being so indulgent of us, actually. So Shayla only had one rule for us, and that was the vice yeah. president is going to be himself. So the plan was Julia's yeah. the actress and he plays himself. How much did that complicate your life? And also working directly with her and the White House staff to create these jokes and, and deliver these comedy experiences? Well, first of all, Shayla is uh, amazing and should be running everything. That's my, that's my feeling. I think she should essentially be running uh, the world, more or less. She's phenomenal. Um, uh, and they, she couldn't have been more helpful to us. But there are lots of things that we, you know, uh, our instinct would be, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we did this? Which, of course, people who are in the world of politics will say, no, 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 you can't do that because the implications are three chess moves ahead that you bozos haven't seen, but we practiced political animals know full well uh, will come and bite us further down the line. So uh, a lot of the suggestions that we initially had, we weren't allowed to uh, follow up on quite reasonably because, you know, all the politicians involved and we had, as well as Joe Biden, we had Nancy Pelosi, we had John Boehner, fantastic uh, people to get to do something like this. Each of those people, you know, really uh, has to keep an eye on stuff that they commit to camera coming back and biting them if they want to run another political campaign or, or however else Politico or their, their enemies may wish to use it. So they're kind of super cautious and we had to all move, uh, do a little dance around each other to find what was the, what was the area that we could all occupy comfortably. Um, so it did complicate things a little bit, but they were, like I say, very helpful, very indulgent of us. Uh, the real complication was the time available because these are the busiest people you can imagine and asking for two days of the Vice President of the United States time is uh, it's a big thing to, to ask actually um, and he, uh, he was incredibly generous with his time uh, as was uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and John Boehner and they, they came along. The thing that they couldn't believe 
uh, they didn't anticipate and found genuinely astonishing was that you don't just do it once. You have to do it again. Once you've done it that way with the camera pointing in that direction, then you have to move the camera and do it there so the other person's uh, lines get shot as well. And then you have to do a shot of the two of them and then you have to do one from behind. That none of them could believe that, uh, that we would take this amount of time to shoot something. I think by the end of the process, all of them were thinking, thank goodness it's not us doing that as a job. John Boehner, when we shot uh, his bit where he's watching a panda on the TV, Boehner, he, um, he was very generous with his time, but after eight minutes he went, right, that's it, and we had to go. Our wonderful director, Mo Marable, said, no, sir, we, we can't go yet. Hey, girl. Hey, J-Dog, are you going to this dinner thing tonight? Well, hell no, I'm not going there. We've got important things going on here in the Capitol. Ooh, yeah, okay, right. Well, let's go into some of the scenes because they were some historic moments. And let's start with the tattoo parlor. So Shayla said to us, listen, if the vice president doesn't have to go to the White House Correspondents' Dinner, what would be a fun place to take them? She said a tattoo parlor. I couldn't believe we we're going to take Nancy Pelosi and the vice president to a tattoo parlor. But there we went. You want to talk about what it was like in that room? Yeah, it was amazing in that room. That was, uh, that was one of the more complex setups that we did because apart from anything else, we had to have uh, tattoos put on the vice president and on Julia. Yeah, can you show us some examples of work that you've done? Yeah, sure. Great. Uh, here, this one I did for Hillary Clinton. Mm. They had their uh, 45 tattoos showing that they were going to be the next president. Uh, and uh, so we had to fly in a tattoo artist to do that, especially who Julia had sourced. Bring it on. Oh, yeah. Bring it on. And it was incredibly complicated setting up the cameras and all this kind of stuff. And we were, it was a small place, a really small room filled with Secret Service guys not cracking a smile and looking like I'm in a room full of needles and the kind of people I would usually be trying to keep hundreds of yards away from my principal. And I have to say, Nancy Pelosi was, uh, of all the good sports we had, Nancy Pelosi was something else because uh, she's, the, she's the only one who, when we presented uh, a scene that we wanted to do, when we sent a script to her office, she's the only one who said, you're not being harsh enough. Right. She wanted a joke that was that was far harsher than the one that we ended up using. She and she was furious when uh, when we said no, we can't we can't do that. We've been told we can't do that joke. She wanted to be really kind of tooth and claw about her satire. She was terrific. In fact, they all were. What are you doing here? Getting my tattoo done. You know the difference between a tattoo and the Koch brothers? No. Mm. They're both painful, but you can get rid of a tattoo. Uh, so that room was. Um, that room was an amazing place to be. You could see a lot of a lot of DC wonks as well, kind of looking around, going, "Well, this is in the city that I live in, but I don't remember ever seeing anywhere like this." They, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely worlds clashing. Can you talk about Julia? Yeah. You can't say enough about Julia Louis Dreyfus and the amount of work that she does uh, on uh, our show, just when we're making our regular show. But what she put into that. A uh, couple of weeks of prep and filming and uh, post-production where we were editing it. She was across every aspect of it. We would write, you know, up to the last minute because, because of course, we were, we were handing in scripts to uh, the various offices, to the president's office as well, because everything had to be okayed. Uh, by uh, his team as well as by uh, the, the Veep's team and everybody else involved. So we were there and they were constantly sending them back to us going, no, we can't say that for this reason or we're a bit unhappy about this. For example, we weren't allowed to run round the Oval Office because it disrespected the room, which we weren't expecting. But that was the, uh, the, the steer and the note that we were given. So we were constantly rewriting these things and Julia was right in the middle of it. And then when we get into the actual shooting of it, it's quite a hard thing to get scripts very late, uh, figure out how you're going to do them in a funny way. Uh, particularly when you're doing stuff that's slightly outside of the normal range of things that you're doing. Because the Vice President and, uh, and Mrs. Pelosi just, you know, they, they weren't used to doing that sort of thing. She kind of had to make it feel okay for them. She had to kind of bring them through and, and you know, all of the weight of the scene, all of the weight of the comedy was on them. And it was up to her to make sure that they seemed funny and that their performances were good as much as it was up to our brilliant director, Mo. So, uh, she did everything. She was kind of mother hen to uh, to the politicians, and she was uh, she was across the entire 
production process. It was quite something, actually. Do you think having a relationship with the vice president in, a, you know, in advance, they had done some things together, helped her uh, work with him? Because they just seemed so natural for someone who was playing themselves and someone who was acting. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think, um, but apart from that, I think they just have quite good rapport. He's a very easygoing guy, uh, is the vice president. He's a charming, uh, garrulous, open and easygoing individual. And I don't think just as a, I mean, politicians are very good at kind of, all the good po successful politicians are good at sort of drawing you in and, and being personable. That's not true, is it? I just thought of Harry Reid. But actually, you know, theoretically, that's the case with, with uh, politicians. But beyond that, there's something about him that's very, very charming. To the point where I can remember that we did a couple of scenes at the Naval Observatory, the vice president's uh, official residence, and uh, one was in the daytime, one was a night shoot. So we had to wait an hour and a half for uh, sundown. Uh, and so we were just hanging around. The crew were just hanging around. And he invited us all into his parlor, really, uh, and, uh, and held court and was, you know, told funny stories and talked to us and was, you know, he was everything that he didn't need to be, but he was utterly sort of charming on a personal level. So I think that helped. Uh, very much, you know, she was she was with somebody like that, and Julia herself is extremely open and charming and welcoming, and uh, so that's a good match up. But certainly, you know, they had both. Um, I think they'd both been to a state dinner in honor of the French president uh, a couple of months previously, and had sat next to each other, so they they'd got to know each other over that time. It definitely helps uh, to do that, especially given that you know he was um, he was a bit nervous because he was. You know, he was scared of making a fool of himself. The, you know, comedy re requires a butt to the to the joke, doesn't it? Every, there's got to be a victim to every joke, and and they were out making fun of themselves, and that's a that's an awkward place for a politician to be. So, um, so I think it was good, as you say, that they'd that they'd met beforehand. But uh, I think it would have been all right anyway because of the two people that they are. So you're, as I said, a British actor, comedian. You've done it all, right? And there you are walking into the Oval Office where 95% of yeah. even the media in Washington never go. And you get to shoot anything yeah. you want, any way you want. You have this great HBO crew. You've got Julia yeah. Lee dreyfus You've got the Vice President yeah. of the United States. Yeah. So get us inside that room and tell us about that shoot. I mean, that was, that was extraordinary. Uh, they gave us 45 minutes in the Oval Office, which was extraordinary. And uh, just before we did that, we were shooting something else over in the Eisenhower, a scene where Joe Biden and Selena Meyer are looking at some headlines and trying to change them. We were, we were making out that it was the offices of the Washington Post, and they were changing headlines on the, uh, on the computers. And all the while they were shooting that, I was having conversations with the president's team about what we could and couldn't do in the Oval Office. And more or less, our script was being junked uh, with about an hour to go before we had to get over there. So that we were so occupied by it, I didn't even really notice that um, we were sitting, we were sitting waiting for that scene in Jay Carney's office. Jay Carney was still there at the time. Uh, and we were sitting uh, in his office on flight cases and all our equipment. And uh, we were just thinking about what we're gonna do when we get in there. Because we were so concerned, because we were so under pressure, where we were wasn't really occurring to us. You know that thing that happens to you sometimes when you're so in your own troubles that you're not actually aware of the, the context that you're in. But we walked into the Oval Office and it's the Oval Office. It's the, it's the most extraordinary room. And we were immediately struck by the fact that it doesn't, it looks like, it's very familiar to you because you've seen the Oval Office on, you know, every film that involved, that has a president in it. Half the TV in the US at the moment has the Oval Office as a standing set. You've seen the Oval Office or representations of it a gazillion times, but nothing really, I don't think, prepares you for, for walking in there. It's more beautiful than you imagine it's going to be. It's lighter and airier and what you don't ever see in films and on the TV is the ceiling. You never see the ceiling because there are TV lights uh, on TV sets. But uh, in the ceiling of the Oval Office, which is beautifully lit and has the, has the presidential seal on it, just makes the room kind of uh, otherworldly, ethereal. It's extraordinary. As soon as we walked in, uh, Georgia Pritchett, who was uh, uh, one of the writers on it, who was there as well, and Julia and I were kind of looking at each other going, oh, my God, uh, because 
suddenly everything that we were worried about had kind of melted away. And we very quickly realised that we had to get ourselves sorted out and stop thinking about where we were because we have 45 minutes to get all these new jokes down and filmed. And that's, you know, to put it in context for people who, you know, have never been on a film set, to get a very simple two people conversation filmed would usually take you between an hour and two hours and we had to do we had to have them come in we had to have several camera positions we weren't allowed to put the lights on the carpet so we had to have a guy actually physically holding the lights there was secret service in there at, at all times uh, so everything felt very pressured the time felt pressured but you know there are these two big guys whose job is to you know to secure and serve the USA who aren't interested in us staring at us not saying, but basically their presence indicating, you do anything wrong, we're here. Uh, so it felt very, it felt oddly uh, pressured. And by the time we left the room, it was almost as though we'd never been in there at all. It was almost as though uh, we'd spent so little, we'd, sp we'd been concentrating so hard on the thing that we were doing, that just that one moment at the beginning where the three of us looked at each other and went, this is the Oval Office. That's the only time we really experienced it. Actually, in there, that's the only time I ever got a smile from, uh, from one of the Secret Service guys, who were amazing. They were great all the way along. But they were exactly as you'd imagine Secret Service people to be super serious, not interested in any frivolity at all, will not crack a smile. You can try and talk to them, but they're not interested in that because that's not what they're there to do. And I remember standing by the mantelpiece, by the fireplace in the Oval Office, and, and in all the fireplaces in the White House, they are all stacked and ready to go. So they have firewood and they have kindling and they have lighters ready. And they're done, you know, they're beautifully twisted. The, the wood is incredibly well stacked and packed. All the kindling has been slotted in perfectly. It's like Jenga or something. You know, it's beautiful twists of paper. It's brilliant. It's perfectly done. And I looked at the fire down there and I, I looked at the guy and went, now that is a really well made fire. And he went, yeah. <laughs> that was the only time I got a smile or a response because he was really proud of his fire. Well, we were right outside the door when you were shooting, and the thing that got the biggest yeah. laugh outside is when Julia said, "It's round, no, you know, no corners." Yeah, there are no corners. Oh, there, there are no corners. There's not one single corner. Oval, oval, oval. Come on. That was the point where we wanted her to run around saying, there are no corners, there are no corners. But uh, the president's team felt that this was disrespectful to the Oval Office. It's an interesting balance that you have to strike there, you know, between uh, being funny about something and going where your satirical instincts would mainly take you, which is to be, you know, a little bit, a little bit cheeky, a little, poking a bit of fun. But they don't want any of that. You can't be cheeky at all. You can't really poke any fun. It's all got to be passed by four people. So then you had the next big experience when you and Julia and the vice president had a special guest in the kitchen. This was an amazing experience because uh, the, the first lady very, very kindly agreed that she would also be in uh, the video. And the, the, the first lady is, it turns out, quite busy. She's got a lot on. Uh, and so Mrs. Obama had 15 minutes to uh, to come and do this scene. She'd been given the, the uh, script the, the night before and she you know, turned up learning, learned her lines perfectly like a good politician. But we had to we had to make sure everything was right. Normally, when you're shooting something, you say, OK, um, can you, the actor, stand there for a moment whilst we adjust these lights to make sure you look right, to make sure that the camera's in the right place, the shot looks good, all of this kind of stuff. But you don't have that time uh, with Michelle Obama. She's got 15 minutes, so she's going to come in, do it, uh, and go again. It was terrifying because it meant that we had to use stand-ins and Julia and I sort of uh, went through the actions together so that the cameras could set up. Um, so I played the first lady for a while there. Uh, it's the closest to power I've ever been. Uh, and uh, the idea, the conceit of the scene was that uh, the vice president and, well, the two vice presidents, in fact, Joe Biden and Selena Meyer, uh, go down into the White House kitchens uh, to find some ice cream. And we, got, we built them these huge, well, the White House pastry chef actually built them these huge buckets of ice cream within loads of sprinkles and marshmallows and crackers and what have you. Uh, and they're scooping this stuff and uh, the first lady uh, comes in and catches them, which uh, she's not happy about because of her, her 
uh, her healthy eating. This is good. My granddaughters like the sprinkles. This is like the sweetest thing you can get in the executive branch. Hey, guys. What are you doing? Nothing. What's in your mouth? Carrots. Hey, don't tell Joe. Haven't you guys listened to anything I said about healthy eating? Hand it over. Let's hand it over. Yep. You guys, come on, let's move. OK, mm. OK. And uh, Selena's forgotten her bag, so she goes back in and then catches Mrs. Obama eating the ice cream herself. Uh, so it's actually, it doesn't sound like it, but it's quite a lot of shots that you have to get. It's quite complicated and a very difficult thing to do in 15 minutes. But uh, she breezed in, shook everyone's hand, was utterly charming, uh, and then just did it four times and left. She was fantastic. When she came on screen, when we showed it, at the uh, at the dinner itself, there was such a huge reaction because nobody was expecting her to her to do that. I do remember uh, when we filmed that scene, uh, the vice president was very concerned because we had a line that said, um, "Don't tell Jill," uh, and he was worried because he didn't want to appear like he was browbeaten by his wife, <laughs> which was really interesting to me. I, 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 and I wondered, who are you worried about? Are you worried about the public or are you actually worried about Dr. Biden herself? Yeah. So we're there that night at the White House Correspondence. You're there. Yeah. The entire cast is there. And we're waiting, waiting, yeah. waiting. It was a very late night um, because the White House Correspondence Association yeah. had their own video. And we're waiting for the video to come up and talk about what it's like when you work on something like that. All your colleagues who worked on it are there. Shayla and the rest of the White House folks who worked with us, we're all anticipating this moment. Well, first of all, the event itself is remarkable. I've watched the correspondence dinner uh, many times over the years. I've watched the president's speech because it's usually so brilliantly done. And it must be said, under the current president, it's embarrassingly well done. For people in comedy, it's kind of, stop being so good at that. It's really bad. We're supposed to do that. You just get on with providing us with the material to do that. Don't be the funny one. Uh, but he's remarkably good at it, uh, President Obama. Again, we're a bunch of Brits who have um, never met the president, never been in a room with the president. We've spent uh, uh, the last three years um, mocking American uh, political systems uh, with our sitcom on HBO. And uh, so it was a really strange room to be in. And the way that, uh, that the, the dinner works, uh, we were all kind of split up amongst different tables. Uh, so there wasn't even anyone, any familiar person to hold on to. And it, we're kind of starstruck because we've been uh, to showbiz do's before. We've been to the Emmys uh, and seen all these exciting people off the TV. Uh, but we always knew that they existed somehow because they're sort of part of our world, if you understand what I mean. But then we're in this room where there's a brass band playing and then the president comes in and there are all these governors and senators that we that we know that we've seen there's Chris Christie who's tiny who knew Chris Christie was tiny he's called big boy terrible skin and uh, you see all these people up close it's absolutely remarkable and we'd you know we've been through this incredible process where we'd it, it had been such a big fight not a fight that's not the right word actually I, I, I rescind that not a fight it had been it, it had been a big effort one way or another to get the thing written to get the thing in place you know I'd had to write things on the plane on the way over other people in the UK had been writing all the way along stuff was being fed in from all sorts of places then we did the three days shoot that was all very intense and involved a lot of revision as we were going along and then the edit itself involved a lot more of of that getting it down to an acceptable time of four minutes from the seven minutes that we felt it sort of naturally was as a piece and all sorts of things so so I was just sort of relieved when I walked into the room apart from being starstruck by all of these political people I was just relieved that we'd managed to get the thing done and then as the evening wore on and the speeches were made and it got closer and closer to the time when the video was going to be shown, I suddenly became incredibly nervous in a way that I haven't been for a very long time, in a way that, you know, it, it's many years since I've been that nervous before going on stage myself, uh, which, which in a way seems like, you know, that's a more immediate personal danger going on stage yourself. Suddenly the enormity of it hit me, I think. 
Um, and I was absolutely terrified by how it would be reacted to. You have to understand, when we put out our TV show, we don't really know what the immediate response is. We can have a look at Twitter and we can wait for the reviews and the blogs uh, and we can look at the consolidated figures and the various other industry metrics by which we decide whether it was a success or not. But you don't have that immediate visceral thing that you do when you put a film out or something that's, that involves an audience seeing it where they're either laughing or they're not. And suddenly that became a big thing. We're always after people laughing, of course. We're always after the best jokes we can get, of course. But we're never usually measured by listening out for actual laughter, and this time we were. I, it, I, it felt incredible. Um, and there were sort of glances around the room at, uh, at one another. And Julia, being you know super special guest, was way, way off. So our team felt very strung out. We couldn't even cling together for support. Um, and then it worked, I think. Remember what got the biggest laugh? It was Julia's line uh, about Kevin Spacey. Yeah, it was. The headline I'd like to write is Selena Meyer sworn in as president, but all in good time. Yes, we can all look directly into the camera, Kevin. The point is, you're not supposed to. Now, if I could just find a young reporter to bang and throw under a train, then we'd be in business. Who the hell are you talking to? Don't worry about it. But the last bit didn't get heard because people were already laughing hugely, which was very pleasing because there's a little rivalry between House of Cards and Veep. What's the biggest difference between British and American sure. media? And do you have anything like the White House Correspondents Association? or a dinner like that? So the second question, no, we don't have anything like that, mercifully, because uh, you should watch our politicians try and be funny. I mean, around the world, politicians trying to be funny generally doesn't go very well. There are one or two members of parliament who are very, very funny, but they are, you know, they, they've never progressed to the government. They've always remained just, you know, in parliament, essentially like, like uh, life a congressman, more or less. So, um, no, we don't have the equivalent, and thank the good Lord for that, because uh, our politicians just, it's, it's awful. It makes some, sometimes when a politician in this country tries to make a joke, you have to spend the next two days winkling your toes individually out of your feet. They've curled so far in uh, on, uh, on themselves. It, it, awful, awful. Uh, as to your first question, what's the biggest difference between the American and the British media? Well, in terms of the sheer practicalities of it, it seems to me that the, the power of the media in this country, in the UK, uh, is largely held by the press. So we have tabloid press where you have tabloid TV, right? So you have the rolling news channels that are the big influencers of opinion. They're the sort of uh, people of first record, if you will. I suppose. Whereas the, the, the written press, even, even august journals like The Post and The New York Times, um, really don't have the same sway uh, as British papers here. They don't have the same punch. Uh, and I think that's it. And I think that's, it, it's partly that that is why we've never managed to um, create a show quite like The Daily Show or like John's show, John Oliver's show, because it's because we don't have the resources. We don't have the rolling news in quite the same way. We don't have uh, the culture of watching uh, that news. I mean, I do, when I'm in the States filming Veep, I watch, I, I flick between CNN, CNN and MSNBC, and um, if the remote's broken, Fox. The voices, the noises, the conversations are very, have a very particular tone and a very particular direction to them that we don't really have, even on our, 24-hour news services, which are very different beasts. So that's, I think, that I think is the main, um, the main difference. Certainly in terms of TV, the bias, the political bias, the political standpoint of each of the channels um, and presenters um, is really clear. You know, we don't have a Bill O'Reilly or an equivalent. We don't have a Rachel Maddow. We don't have uh, commentators like that. That's just not something that exists because of, partly because of the laws governing what can and can't be said in news broadcasts in this country. 
Um, which isn't to say that we don't know, you know, people assume the BBC is uh, biased to the left. In fact, actually, people who are on the left think the BBC is biased to the right, and people who are on the right think the BBC is biased to the left. So my suspicion is the BBC is probably getting it about right. But there are things like Sky News, where we know it's Murdoch-owned, and so it's hard not to see it as having some you know, swing towards the right, whether or not that's, that, that bears up to studying it closely. The, the media in, in the US is so very, wears its heart on its sleeve so very clearly that uh, it makes it an entirely different beast. If you remove all that stuff, if you, if you, if you take uh, the news casting that is supposed to be more down the line, supposed to be more straightforward and less coloured by um, opinion, uh, then um, it tends to be less brutal than um, in the UK. Uh, that's what our papers are. They are absolutely brutal. They, there is the, the sense of deference towards politicians has long since gone. It's beginning to go now in America, but it's still there to an extent. The interesting thing for me about Veep, and I think why it's a successful program, is that usually uh, uh, politics and DC are presented by by the media as in, in actuality, or represented on TV and in film and in books and on, in stage plays in the US as either being a great thing that's to be aspired to that in that kind of West Wingish way, uh, or uh, evil and um, full of Machiavellian types, Francis Underwood House of Cards representation. What's different about Veep is that it suggests that it's basically run by idiots because it's run by people and people are idiots. And if we look at ourselves and how competent we consider ourselves to be in our actual lives uh, and then imagine that there are similar people in <laughs> Washington, uh, that's more likely to be the actual reality uh, of it. Um, we in the U UK are much more used to that idea, the idea that they are fundamentally incompetent than the US. And I think the US is beginning to catch up. And when it does, I think that our, our medias will be closer than they currently are. That's a very long answer, but it's a very, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a nuanced difference, I think. Chris, I want to ask you about Veep, because it's a bunch of Brits. Yeah who are hilarious, writing the greatest parody about U.S. politics, according to the critics. Why have you gotten this so right, and the Americans maybe have not gotten it so right? I think it's because uh, we come from uh, a culture where we um, look at uh, politics as flawed because it's run by idiots. Um, and that's, that's the appealing thing, that's the appealing new thing about Veep. I do think, however, there's another thing which is that it struck me when I was watching a film that I shan't name that was a, about a, 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 a key moment in American history. Written by an American, directed by an American, as you would imagine. And I was watching it going, this just feels a bit hagiographical, you know, it feels a bit like, uh, like it, it's bringing too much historical baggage with it. Wouldn't it be interesting if instead of the Brits filming history about themselves and the Americans filming history about themselves, we just swapped. Because I think as outsiders, we have a very interesting and fresher uh, and maybe even less um, compromised view of what actually is going on than, uh, than when we're looking at our own things because we're so used to the ideas that, that naturally for us come along with them. You know, it would be much more interesting to watch an American uh, take on how Churchill ran the war than it would be to see a British take on it, because we pretty much know what the British take would be. It would be a much more interesting thing to see a bunch of Brits look at Washington than a bunch of Americans look at Washington, because, you know, because the, the Brits are starting from scratch and, and looking at it with fresh eyes. That, I think, is why it's been successful. But we've also got form, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I, I direct Veep and produce it, and, um, uh, but it, the, the writers go way back 10 years ago to uh, a show that we did in the UK, which I was in um, and latterly directed uh, a little, uh, which was called The Thick of It, which was set in a minor ministry uh, in the British government. And so we did that and then we did a film uh, a few years later uh, called In The Loop, which uh, was an, a sort of UK-US 
thing because it was about the rush towards a war in the Middle East, a, a fictional war in the Middle East. Uh, so we've been working in that political satirical style for a decade. And I think by the time Armando Iannucci, who created this whole thing, uh, brought it over to the States for Veep four years ago, uh, I think that craft was pretty well honed. So it's coming up to 2016. Julia Louis Dreyfus's character, Selena Myers, is now president. Who better than you, a British comedian, to talk about the candidacy of Hillary Clinton or any of the presidential candidates? You've already talked to us about your view of Chris Christie. What about Hillary Clinton's run? Does she have a chance? Tiny man. I find Hillary Clinton's run to be very depressing. Depressing? Uh, because she could be the first woman president. Depressing. That would be amazing. No question that, that her being the first woman president will be amazing. Let's have a woman president. Let's, let's have two women on each running t on each ticket. Let's do that. Okay. And let's, make, let's just agree that that's going to happen now. That would be brilliant. I'm all for that. Let's have it. However, there's something really distressing about watching American political dynasties. Really, really upsetting. Because this country that prides itself on having rejected monarchy and rejected the idea of royal families actually has more than one royal family. It's got Kennedys and it's got Clintons and it's got Bushes. And the fact that it, the people are talking about a Clinton versus Bush thing, I, I, it just, I, I'd love it to be Elizabeth Warren. I know that's a very sort of progressive thing and it's unlikely to happen. I'd like it to be well, a woman, I really, funny. really would. Although, no, well, here's the thing, right? I mean, I'm all f I do think it would be brilliant to have a, a female president for all sorts of reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good. We have Mrs. Thatcher between 1979 and 1990, and that was a disaster. Uh, depending on where you live in our country, you know, for, for some people it was a huge win. If you, weren't, if you lived in the southeast, terrific. If you're where I'm from, from, from the north of England, it was, it was devastating. She was a disaster. So it's not that a woman is necessarily going to run anything better, but it would just be great in the modern age to have a woman do one of those jobs, please, sometime soon, please. That would be good, because at the moment, Angela Merkel is doing a great job <laughs> holding up women in democracy. But can we have some, you know, let's have a bit, let's have the president of the United States. But let's not have it be Hillary Clinton, because as much as I like Hillary Clinton, it's really boring and depressing that uh, America, uh, for all its uh, desire to be this democratic beacon, and for all its claims, many of which are perfectly fair and right, it is still in the sway of these dynasties. You've got more, we, at least we only have one royal family and they have no power. You've got like four, and they run the place. Are you going to subpoena Selena Meyer's emails now that she's president? <laughs> well, we did that. We, we, we did that in, in season one, which actually I wasn't involved in, but, the, but Selena's emails were all, were all laid out. Um, that would be good, actually. Do you know what? People have often wondered about a tie-in book. Maybe that's it. Maybe we should subpoena her emails for a tie-in book. That would be the thing to do. Thank you, Chris Addison. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Tammy. For Washington Insider, I'm Tammy Haddad. Thanks for joining us. Please note our program is in no way affiliated with the White House Correspondents Association. Our views are our own. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and keep an eye out for more episodes coming soon. Co-executive producer Julie Donofrio and Haddad Media. These programs are produced in conjunction with Simon Marks and the Feature Story News team, including Rob Flynn. Special thanks to HBO and BBC.